قول بسم الله People of Speakers Corner, I want to share a story with you. I want to share an example with you. This example is of a caterpillar. A caterpillar who all year round eats leaves and other things. And at one point when a caterpillar, when it wants to go through a state change, when it wants to go through a state change, it slowly creates a cocoon. And this cocoon, this shell, it remains in. And it grows, and it grows, and it struggles. And it doesn't have an external way of getting food. And it doesn't have somebody coming along and giving it water. It struggles. And we as human beings in this life, we also struggle. We also go through struggles. Whether you are a Muslim, an atheist, a Christian, a Jew or Lady Gaga, you will go through some struggles in life. Now what happens in this cocoon? If you go along when this caterpillar, and this caterpillar is trying to escape slowly and is struggling out of the cocoon, this caterpillar, if you go along and you try and break open the cocoon to try and help it, it falls to the floor and that's the end of it. But if you leave it there to let it struggle, to let it strive, to let it grow, it turns and breaks into a beautiful butterfly. And this is the example of this life. The example of this life is such that we will also always go through struggles. We will always have some sort of financial issue. We will always have some sort of health issue. We will always have some sort of personal problem or a problem with our family or a problem with our work. There is no human being on this planet except that they go through some forms of struggle. Since we go through these struggles, we should ask a question. A very basic question. What's the point? What's the point of carrying on? Why don't we just give up? If we only go from one state of problems to another state, what's the problem? You see, there has to be something that drives a human being, that makes a human being think, you know what? I've got something to look forward to. There is something that I need to go towards. There is a goal, there is ambition, there is a landmark that I need to head towards. And when you have that in your mind, and you know that that is your goal, there is something that keeps driving you. This is why human beings, when they lose the willpower to live, they can die even if they're millionaires and even if their health is good. Because the willpower to live, the willpower to remain, to struggle, is something which drives a human being to do the actions that they're going to do. Now the question really is this, who defines your goals? Have you defined them yourself? Have you understood what the purpose of life is? Why you actually exist in the first place? I'm here to share a message and I'm not just here to preach to you. If you disagree with me, you can shout, this is Speaker's Corner. You can say, I totally disagree. But what I'm about to say, I believe, is very rational, is very commonsensical, and is very natural to the human being. The first thing is this. If we imagine that the only one that can tell us our purpose of life is the one who created us, is the one who fashioned us, then we would know that this is the being who would know what the actual purpose of life is, rather than us defining it in an arbitrary way. The Creator would know what's actually good for us. 
Why is that now necessarily can, true? Why is what necessarily why true? That, why would someone who created us necessarily know what is good for us? Okay. Why is this impossible that someone could create a creature and then design a nefarious purpose for it just for their amusement? Okay, that's a very good question. I've forgotten your name. I spoke to you before, yeah. though. Yeah, James. What's, James, you're, you're so good. what's your name again? James. 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 So James asked a question. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to repeat the question so everyone can hear. What makes us think that this creator has actually given us a purpose rather than there being an inbuilt purpose or there being no purpose? Is that what you were saying? Not quite. Okay. Uh, I thought that you said that the person who created us would necessarily have a purpose which is the best for us. And yes, yes. Know our best, what is best for us. That's what I was so, saying, yeah. Okay, so why is this impossible that uh, a, uh, a creator could create a creature and then design a bad purpose for it and just have an affair, just create something. Or no purpose at all. Amusement. Okay, good question. Now this question boils down to how do I know what I am saying is actually true? Because if I come along to you, James, and I say, I have this book, this book is from God, and this is the Quran, and this says the purpose of life is to worship God. Somebody else comes to you, James, and says, actually the purpose of life is something else you have the right sir to say what proof do you have what evidence do you have that this is the word of god because i could make up an arbitrary purpose and he could make up an arbitrary purpose anyone can write a book there has to be some form of evidence it's like this imagine if one day you receive a letter which is supposed to be from a king but the letter is printed on some cheap A4 paper and it's got spelling mistakes and the way it's written it looks like it's been written by some chav in Essex. You're going to think to yourself this is not written by a king. You need to have evidence that that letter is from the king and the evidence is the way the letter is presented to you and also the content. So I'm going to make a claim and I'm happy for yourself and other people to challenge the claim. I'm going to make a claim that this is a book of God for two reasons. The first reason is something we can all agree about. The second reason is something which is personal to you. And that's between you and the Creator. So the first reason is this. There are miraculous parts of this book which cannot be explained using human agency. And that's something we can objectively argue about. The second point is if you sincerely as a human being, you ask for guidance, God will show you this is the truth. But that's not an objective argument. So the first one is, so let me explain to you why. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he came 1400 years ago. And when he came 1400 years ago, he made precise predictions. Now throughout history, we get many people making predictions. The ancient Mayan people used to make predictions. The ancient Chinese used to make predictions. The ancient Hindus used to make predictions. Even we had Alistair Crowley, who believed in his own religion. And he believed he was making prophecies and he had revelation. Now, what's the criteria to test whether something is or is not a genuine prophecy? I want to ask you that. How would you discern the truth from falsehood? Exactly, you would use empirical evidence. Something verifiable, something falsifiable and something precise. You can't have a vague prophecy like near the end times the trees will move slightly towards the west. What does that mean? Because the trees moving towards the west, is that literal? Is that metaphorical? Does that mean trees are going to be cut down? We need something objective. So let me give you some objective evidence why I believe the Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God. Let me give you one piece of evidence. The Muslims were only in one small city, the city of Medina. In the city of Medina, they were surrounded by pagans all around them. And in that city, they had a siege from external forces, external forces of pagan Arabs. 10,000 of them came to the city. And the only Muslims that existed on earth existed in that city. So one of the Muslims was from Persia. His name was Salman al-Farsi. And he said, in my area, what we do when we are under siege is we build a trench around the city. So they decided to build a trench around the city. They were completely cut off from all forms of supply and they were outnumbered three to one. When they were building this trench, 
there was a large boulder which was there. And when the Muslims were digging, they couldn't get rid of this boulder. So they called the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now the Prophet was not an average man of average strength. He was a big man with very muscular body and he was somebody who could do a task like this. So he came along and what did he say? He said, in the name of God, Bismillah, and he struck the rock. And when he struck the rock, he said, you, the Muslims, you will conquer greater Sham. And then he struck the rock and he said, in the name of God. And he said, you, the Muslims, you will conquer Persia. And then he struck the rock again and he said, you, the Muslims, you will conquer Yemen. Let me give you a context here. The superpowers of the world today are Russia, America, China. These are the superpowers today. The superpowers at his time were the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. So this, according to one non-Muslim historian, is the equivalent of Eskimos today claiming they're going to defeat China and America. Two superpowers, a small group. What happened 10 years after his death? 10 years after his death, Persia was conquered by Muslims. Syria was conquered by Muslims. Yemen was conquered by Muslims. Exactly like he prophesied. Also, these, good question, good question. Now, it's very easy for me to say the Prophet said this or the Prophet said that. Now I'm going to make a claim and you can challenge this claim. Every single statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that we have today is a statement which was recorded hundreds of years ago by his companions and this was transmitted. And we have an entire science of understanding which narrations are correct, which narrations are false, which narrations are weak. Now, I understand from a skeptical point of view, it may make sense for someone to say, let's do a reverse engineering. So for example, today, for me to claim I am a prophet of God and for me to claim that space exploration is going to happen. Well, that's rich because space exploration has already happened. So this is a reverse engineered uh, prophecy. But with the Prophet Muhammad's prophecies, these are not reverse engineered. And let me give you one very powerful proof. There is a book called Sahih Bukhari. And this book is an ancient book which you can go and verify yourself. In this ancient book, it mentions that the Prophet Muhammad said, and this book is hundreds of years old. It mentions the Prophet Muhammad said, when somebody came to meet him, he said to him, when is the last hour? When is the day of judgment? The Prophet said, the Prophet said, when you see the barefooted Bedouin Arab competing for tall buildings. So he gave a precise people who are going to be doing a precise action. And I want you to understand something. There are two types of Arabs. There are city dwellers who live in great cities like Damascus, Alexandria, Cairo, Yemen, uh, sorry, Sana. They live in these sort of places. And there's another type of Arab, a destitute Arab known as the Bedouin Arabs. The Bedouin Arabs at the time of the Prophet and before the Prophet and after the Prophet, even until the 1950s, were poor, uneducated, illiterate and generally people who were cut off from the rest of the world. Now, if the Prophet wanted to make a prediction which was going to be self-fulfilling, he should have said, the Persians are going to compete with each other to, tall, tall, to build tall buildings. Why? Because the Persian capital, Tessiphon, was the biggest city in the world. Or he should have said, the Romans are going to compete with each other, the Byzantines are going to compete with each other for tall buildings. Why? Because Hagia Sophia was the tallest building on earth for centuries. So, one second, one second, one second. Let, let me complete and we'll go back. One second. What, 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 as soon as one group of people is rich enough to build the tallest building, yes. if they believe that they're Muslims, they'll be like, oh, this is a great chance. I told, sir, I'm exactly, I'm already about to explain what you're about to say because I know that that question was coming. 
the Prophet Muhammad, if he wanted a self-fulfilling prophecy, he should not have said the Bedouin Arabs. He should have said the other nations. Plus, here's the thing. It does, it does. Because they are people who don't have wealth. And until the 1950s, before we discovered the black, black gold of oil, these same people did not have access to the wealth to build tall buildings. Now, here's the thing. In the 1950s, one second, one second. At some point, they will. Let, 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 a long enough time. Okay, sir, so I'm going to, every single contention, I promise you, I'll answer one by one. And yours too, one by one. Okay, one by one. I have all day, don't worry. I'm fasting today, I got nothing to eat. Don't worry about it. So, what was I saying? Yes, self-fulfilling prophecies. Now the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did not like tall buildings. He did not like extravagant buildings. In fact, he actually told Muslims not to do that. There is verses of the Quran which talk about the vanity of building buildings. So if he wanted a self-fulfilling prophecy, he should have said the city dwelling Arabs are going to build buildings to compete with each other. And to couple this, he should have encouraged them to build tall buildings. But he didn't do that. He spoke about a poor group. And two, he told people not to tall, build tall buildings. So the self-fulfilling prophecy or the reverse engineered prophecy doesn't make sense. And I'm going to give you a reference here. There is a book published called Arabian Sands. This book, I've forgotten the name of uh, the author, but it's called Arabian Sands, published by Penguin. And this book is written by a British explorer, Wilfred something, um, when he was traveling through these Bedouin areas in the 1940s. Read that book and look what he says about the Bedouins. Look what he says about how poor they were, about the way they actually lived. The Bedouin Arabs, they were unaffected by the golden age of Islam. When the Arabs, along with the Persian and the rest of the Muslim world, were at the forefront of the world in terms of science and education, the Bedouin Arabs were living in the same way as before, milking camels and eating dates and going to war. They were doing the same thing they were doing at that time. After the Golden Age, when we had, after the Umayyads, after the Abbasids, when we had the Ottoman period, when we had the Ottoman Empire, when the Ottomans, the Ottoman Turks, when they controlled a large mass of the world, when they were the rulers of the Muslims, the Bedouin Arabs were living in the exact same way that they were living before. So this group of people, from every counterfactual factual way, from every falsification way, when you try and check that, there is no way that if the Prophet wanted a self-fulfilling prophecy or a reverse engineered prophecy, he should have made other guesses. But if I was to tell you, because some people are coming up... Sure, 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 sir, every, sir, every, every type of prophecy that you want, it's in the Quran or in the narrations that's going to fulfill you. Okay, go ahead, give me any false prophecy. Okay, so Muhammad claims that hereditary, like whether a son or a daughter takes after the mother or the father, is determined by whether the mother or the father during coitus, which one reaches their discharge first. And that totally flies in the face of modern genetics. That's totally false. Okay. It doesn't matter whether a woman orgasms at all. She need not. Like all that matters is which genes are in the gametes that okay. make up the Okay, but sir, zygotes. are you telling me this? Are you telling me this is an unfulfilled prophecy it's or a false, false prophecy. or one second, unfulfilled or falsified? It's falsified. Okay. By if, any okay, standard. sure, sure. And if it's, it's if it's falsified, then that means that that conclusion that you're talking about in science is written in stone. Well, it's, it's as written in stone as unless you want to be so, super un, like skeptical of all biology. No, but no, but sir. Like no, and like ignore vaccines, but no, but sir, 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 I'm gonna answer all those questions, but for, first, I want to ask you this Is that written in stone, whatever that conclusion is? We can have more confidence in that conclusion than we can have in that's not what I asked. With, well, but, but, it isn't written in stone, sure, but we can have more confidence in it than we can in you know some guy 1400 years ago saying that hereditary is determined by whether the man or the sure. woman all gathers sure. first. Sure, sure. Sir, look at this, right? You're talking about an epistemic issue. 
about we can have more confidence in this rather than that. I'm not asking that question. I'm saying the conclusion that any science can come up with today. Is it something which is absolutely certain which will never change due to future evidence? 